Hello and welcome to Money Matters. Over the last decade, cannabidiol, or CBD, a derivative of marijuana, has entered the legal market in many countries. With proven demand, new products are now available, from edibles to bombs and even beauty products. Last year, Hong Kong opened its doors to the first CBD cafe. This isn't your average cafe latte. It has a special ingredient, cannabidiol or CBD, the second most active ingredient in marijuana. In the last few years, CBD has become popular as a natural treatment for anxiety, sleep disorders, and muscle pain. And no, it doesn't cause a high. So what is the point of having caffeine, having coffee with CBD in it? Doesn't it just, coffee wakes you up and CBD calms you? A lot of people, when they have caffeine, maybe too much caffeine, they get anxious or jittery. What CBD does is actually helps counteract the kind of intensity of the caffeine. You still get the energy release of the caffeine, but you tend to have a calmer, more down-to-earth response as well to the caffeine from a kind of anxiety point of view. The city's first CBD cafe opened last July in the middle of the pandemic. Despite the dining restrictions, the cafe has done well selling their products to retail customers and businesses. We actually suspected there was a big demand in Hong Kong. Um, before we opened, there was really no dedicated outlet for CBD products. And even though there was a lockdown, I think we had a we benefited also from the renewed focus on health and wellness last year because everyone was thinking about their health. And then we definitely had some work from home people calling in during work hours. So overall, it was quite a positive thing. Ben is a regular. Since working from home has actually started, I've been here more often just because it's actually a relatively nice working environment, but I'd say three or four times a week. I initially used it to deal with, you know, exam stress, you know, finals week, you know, too much coffee, non not enough sleep, and I've kind of continued to use it for those main reasons. So CBD oil for sleep before I go to bed has generally helped me. And then I also use like this balm on, you know, my knees, which have particular muscle soreness and, you know, pain after running. And I found that that helps me as well. In Hong Kong, only pure CBD or CBD isolate is legal. Anything containing tetrahydrocannabinol or THC, the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana, is illegal and considered a dangerous drug. At this cafe, all the products are reportedly CBD isolate. Hong Kong CBD standards differ from those in the U.S., which allows 0.3% of THC, and Europe, which allows 0.2% THC. There are some studies that show CBD is more effective when paired with THC. Quite a lot of what they claim as CBD, with actually, which is effective, is actually end up uh, was found to have a little bit of THC indeed, and but sadly to say uh, that is not allowed in our uh, local uh, law. I mean the, the legal system where we have a strict control on the use of THC because of this addictive uh, propensity. Dr. Max says using CBD to treat anxiety or sleep disorders isn't really solving the deeper problem. What's needed is to see a doctor to get to the root of the disorder. He says there are better and more effective medications than CBD for those problems. We are talking about whether we should choose a more safe, a safer way to manage this issue rather than like taking risks of trying CBD with a little bit of THC and self-medicated them without a proper guidance. Different persons have their own body, uh, like metabolism or their adaptability to certain medication. CBD is also being used in beauty products. What will this help my skin achieve? This has ingredients that will regenerate mm -hmm. collagen and elastin. So you using it after like two, three weeks, mm -hmm. you will start to see that fine lines, dry lines will, will, will be smoothed out and okay. complexion will be more smooth. It would like pigmentation um, would be diminished and coloring would be more fair. 
this beauty serum was launched just last year, also during the pandemic. It contains CBD along with a number of plant ingredients. Kristen Tong, COO of Miyakwa, says the CBD helps for better absorption of the other ingredients since it has anti-inflammatory properties. CBD helps to soothe and calm the, um, the, the skin, calm the inflammation, calm the sensitivity. When your skin is calm, it's more receiving of nutrients, um, vitamins and minerals. Because of the pandemic, they weren't able to push through with their in-store launches, so they went online. Ironically, the pandemic has helped them as people have moved to online shopping. Kristen says that having CBD as an ingredient opens up a lot of dialogue with clients. You get questions like, oh, when I use this product, am I going to get high? You know, and so it's, it's like, it, no, I think, the, I think it's good that people ask questions. I think the, it's important for the market to, to, you know, to increase their knowledge. We now um, hold regular workshops, um, small groups in the office or larger groups in, on Zoom, and we talk about our products. It's a, it, you'd be surprised like how, how many people really want to know um, about plant ingredients. It's, it's, yeah, it's very encouraging. CBD has gained traction at a time when the public and government's views of cannabis has changed dramatically. CBD-related companies listed on stock exchanges have seen their valuations climb since 2014. If you go all the way back to 2014 when Colorado uh, legalized, U.S. cannabis stocks, which weren't even real companies, there weren't that many of them, but they, they went up like... 10 times, 20 times. And then uh, in Canada, right when they legalized for adult use in October of 18, uh, the stocks soared and they haven't seen levels like that since then. According to Wise Guy Research Consultants, the global market for CBD oil is projected to grow from 967.2 million U.S. dollars in 2020 to 5.3 billion U.S. dollars by 2025. Growth drivers include expanded distribution in retail chains, product diversity, and e-commerce. During the pandemic, CBD was classified as essential in the U.S. Our dispensaries were able to use e-commerce for the first time in many cases uh, as the states wanted to reduce in-store purchasing. So uh, pickup and delivery, which had not been options in most places, were allowed. And all of a sudden, the legal market was able to compete with the illicit market, which can't put up a website. And it's not just in the Americas that the industry is thriving. Israel has a medical cannabis program and it's doing very well and it's uh, about to uh, go legal perhaps later this year. Germany has a medical cannabis program. What's phenomenal about that program is that uh, patients are reimbursed by insurance and they buy in their pharmacies. Brockstein says the current valuations of CBD companies are solid and it's a product with proven demand. It's just a matter of moving people from the illicit market to the legal market, something the pandemic has helped with. The largest market cap U.S. company is about uh, 11 or 12 billion right now. I think this is why we're seeing institutional investors come into the market. It, it's a reasonable price, especially when you consider that it's profitable and growing very rapidly. And then I, I think the other thing that's encouraging is that's just the biggest company. There, there's so many other companies with market caps of uh, a billion or, or less that, that are more, you know, that have better valuation, uh, more compelling valuation. For now, CBD looks set to go higher as companies do more research into its uses. Coming up next, the charms of living on Chung Chow as our exploration of Island's district property continues. Stay with us.
Welcome back to Money Matters. The island of Chengchou is home to the Bun Festival. Most weekends, the sleepy fishing harbor is swamped with tourists and day trippers in need of some fresh air and seafood. Residential prices and rents offer good value. Reporter Alice Khan visited some homes with unobstructed sea views and an abundance of character. It may be too expensive to purchase or rent a place with panoramic sea views in Discovery Bay, so this week we traveled to another outlying island, Chungchao, which offers attractive prices. Chungchao literally means Long Island, located 10 kilometers southwest of Hong Kong Island. It is nicknamed the Dumbbell Island due to its shape. It's famous for its annual bun festival, seafood restaurants, the beach in Tung Wan, and its water sports. There are still fishing fleets working from the harbor. The central part of the island is well developed with shops and houses, many built along the waterfront. Residential areas sit on the hills to the north and south. Chungchao has been inhabited for longer than most other places in Hong Kong and has a population of 21,800 as of June 2020. Most of the local residents are descended from fishermen or farmers. There's a small and devoted expat community. Property agents say flat prices and rents have gone up about 10% a year for the last 10 years because of strong demand from the locals and expats. Still, there's value to be had. Currently, Chungchao has about 6,000 apartments and about 100 villas. The average property price here is $9,000 per square foot. Rents are around $20 per square foot. This agent says the lower rents draw many people to move to Chengchao. Usually, those who move from Central, Shangwan, or the Western District, the main reason is that the rent on Chengchao is much cheaper than those areas. For example, in the western part of Hong Kong Island, the rent for a room is 8,000. Here, you can rent a 350 square foot flat for less than 8,000. The first property we found was in a relatively upscale estate. Most flats in the older sections of the island measure 350 square feet, but the flats here are larger. The estate has 159 apartments and 12 villas. Our first flat is 451 square feet on the ground floor of a villa. It also has a 100 square foot garden. Asking rent is $9,900 or $21.90 per square foot. The landlord bought the flat six months ago. He renovated it and put it on the market to lease. The flat has a square shaped living and dining room. The bedrooms are also square, but the windows are small, so it doesn't have abundant natural light in the rooms. Also, it lacks a view. The agent says expats usually prefer larger flats. Rents for those 1,200 square foot to 15, 1,600 square foot properties range from 20,000 to 25,000. Usually, expats would go for those properties. I know many that came from Discovery Bay. The rent for an apartment in DB would cost around 20,000. The size is not big. In Chengchao, they can rent a house with a rooftop. He says expats go for the houses on the hills. So we checked out this villa in the southern hills sitting above the sea. The owner bought this 1,100 square foot villa for $1.6 million 20 years ago. Now he's selling it for $7.8 million. Dan and his family live next door in a villa with the same floor plan. He used to rent a flat in Tin Hao, but he decided to move to Chengchao 10 years ago for the space. For me, who grew up in the countryside with big land and farms around, I just had a gut feeling like, for kids, I want, I want more nature, I want fresh air, um, and I want, yeah, you know, the ability to run outside and play. And... He bought his villa for three and a half million dollars. What attracts you to this property? Uh, when we first came, it, uh, there was a video of it that was quite dark and not very appealing. But when we came here, we were sort of breathless at the beauty of the south-facing light uh, and just sort of the, the multiple levels, um, the, the quality of the construction. 
The 200 square foot terrace faces the sea. He puts a pool here in the summer. Did you redeed the whole house? We redid the whole house, and the idea was to make it very light and airy and uh, with lots of glass to let the natural sunlight go in and everything inside would be white. We, we chose to put glass here. This is the window with the uh, triple pane Korean glass to protect from the typhoons. And uh, shall I show you the house? This is our living room, about 200 square feet. We built in a desk for uh, the kids for studying. We have the L-shaped uh, couch uh, over here on this side, which looks out into the sea. The kitchen is open plan, and there's a 1,000 square foot garden in the back. This is a beautiful area for the kids to play. We have, of course, the hammock for daddy when he's tired, or mommy. We have uh, avocado trees and uh, papaya trees, magnolia tree. This is our grass, which we're regrowing. What's that? So this is a swerfer, which is a surfing swing, which we built for the kids. So we suspended a line from the Norfolk pine to the roof. And then, if you're brave, you can kind of go across the lawn. The villa is a split-level duplex. The ensuite master bedroom is on the first floor. It has a balcony overlooking a sea view. How big is it? Yes, uh, this is the master bedroom. I think it's about 120 square feet um, with high ceilings, as all the rooms in the house have, with the fan and the sea view and the sun coming up every morning. And again, the double or triple pane glass here and full full uh, glass windows. Property prices on Chengtao for purchasing, I think, is a third of what it is on Hong Kong Island. So if it was, when we moved here, it was 3,500 per square foot. At that time in Hong Kong, it was 10,000 per square foot. Now, or a couple of years ago, well, it probably has doubled in 10 years. Australian Graham Elsom has lived on Chengchao for 46 years. Working as a travel consultant in Central, the now retired islander moved to northern Chengchao after becoming enchanted with its character. I was the first Westerner to move to this end of the island. So it was very, very quiet. The island had a wonderful, classic old China feel about it. It's still, it's still probably one of the most unspoiled of the islands. The feeling of a Chinese fishing village that was genuine. The location of the flat was love at first sight, and the view, lots of view. I was walking along the bottom there, and I looked up at the top of the hill, and I saw this house under construction. There were no windows or anything. There was only the floor, the floor and the steps. But I walked up onto the roof and looked at the view, and I thought, well, this is fantastic. Graham rented two 350 square foot flats on the same floor for two years for about $500. He bought them two years later for $15,000. There is a living, bed, and bathroom space on one side and a single lounge and dining space on the other. There was a wall here, and this was a balcony. And there was a wall there where the clock is on the wall. There was a wall there. There was a bedroom behind it. So I've turned it all into one room. And yeah. how about the windows? Well, I had them made larger as well. That was, my, that was my number one requirement, that I have big windows so I can look at the view. So these windows are pretty much wrapped around, and you can, as you can see, you can see out of them pretty easily. Graham likes to walk in the hills behind the flat. The tourists like the walk as well. And as he strolls along the harbor front, he recalls the changes he's seen over the years. The small family fishing boats, the, the old teak wood boats that were actually very beautiful, um, they've been replaced by these big, uh, big boats, which are like factory boats, I suppose. So they're not nearly as um, attractive. In 1976, it was very different. The buildings here are very colorful and they've all been modernized. Uh, the old ones were so wonderful in the old style. The ever-changing charms of Chung Chao 
can still be found around every corner. Dragging and pressing a paintbrush, Sophia the robot is creating her latest artwork. A self-portrait, a collaboration between her Hong Kong-based creator, an Italian artist, and Sophia. An amalgam of shapely microchips, plastic, and AI ingenuity. The virtual, the real, the imaginal, and the literal. This kind of spirit of creativity and technology working together gives me hope that we can solve anything. Her digital artwork was sold at auction for nearly 700,000 U.S. dollars. Oh, wow. The work sold to an anonymous buyer called 888 in the form of a non-fungible token, or NFT, a digital signature saved on blockchain ledgers that allows anyone to verify the ownership and authenticity of digital art items. NFTs have become the latest investment craze, with one artwork selling this month for nearly $70 million. What we're seeing right now, it looks like a, a bit of a bubble, uh, especially in the NFT art world. And, and I would really advise people to, um, like anything else, only invest what you're willing to lose or what you can afford to lose. Uh, and if you're looking at art, buy it because you love it, not because you think it's going to go up in value. The same rules apply uh, with anything uh, in NFT art as they do in the real world uh, and traditional art. Uh, really think about it for its fundamental value rather than for its investment value. Sophia's creator, Hong Kong-based David Hansen of Hansen Robotics, said the work came out of a process described as iterative loops of evolution. And we've been exploring uh, Sophia's creativity on the side, but we really have been developing her as a platform and as a character um, more than um, as a work of fine art. So I'm really happy to uh, revisit that uh, uh, world of pure creativity. The number of the auction, like the amount of, of money that her artwork has generated, is a great validation uh, for, uh, for this kind of creative project. Art insiders say the collaboration makes a statement to the art world and the technology world and heralds a new road on which AI robots and humans collaborate, hopefully enhancing each other. That's the show. Thanks for watching. Next time on Money Matters, a conversation with Eddie Yu, CEO of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. See you then. Good night.